Would you like to see an x-ray of your soul? An x-ray of your emotional infrastructure? Well, just like the body today with scans, with x-rays, with different types of technologies, we can see the inner workings of what makes us tick. We have a blueprint that will give you a picture of the spectrum of your emotions and understanding how they work and what you can do to improve them. Check out the description below. The special Omer book, 49 Steps, Personal Refinement, Character Development, Understanding and Cultivating the Very Nature of Your Emotional Being. So Picasso famously said that art is a lie that reveals a deeper truth. Because all art is uh, stationary, essentially, and all of life is mobile. And uh, so I would like to add, if I could, that chassidus is a uh, truth that reveals a deeper lie. And I'll explain why. Handel Lieberman, one of the Hasidic artists of the previous generation, one of the pioneers, together with Zalman Kleiman, who depicted and painted the old shtetl and captured it so vividly. At the time when we were growing up as children, no one knew that they would become superstars. At the time, they were just two Hasidic schleppers here in Crown Heights. And uh, so in case you feel you're that way, you never know where your future is going. Um, and then as time passed, you start valuing what they were able to um, achieve. So he wrote a letter to the Rebbe. Being an artist, you could imagine he had a complex soul. And part of it was also that he dealt with uh, depressing moments, darker moments. And he wrote to the Rebbe about his depression and about how down he feels and the fatalistic and resigned. And the Rebbe wrote back to him, it's a letter that's available, that he's surprised that he's writing this way because being an artist, one of the things of an artist is never to look at the surface of things, but to show us the soul of the events and the inner choreography, I'm paraphrasing, of uh, what the real story is. So the fact that he's writing that he's down and depressed, that's only looking at the surface. And if he dug deeper into the bigger story, the greater narrative, so to speak, he would find so much positivity and beauty. So in other words, the Rebbe was basically saying that you're not applying your artistic ability to your own personal life. You're projecting it for others, but you yourself. But that's not uncommon. You find many often the artists, like they say about clowns, they make other people laugh while they're crying inside. So with that said, so Picasso came from his perspective, you know, trying what we call from the bottom up, trying to use his artistic ability, as so many other artists do, to look at the world with a new set of eyes and allow us to glimpse into a deeper picture, whether it's of a personality or a, or a natural sight or an abstract art. What Chassidus does is the exact opposite. It uh, looks at the world through God's eyes and to see from the top down you know, what, through the lens of the divine, the ultimate artist who created it all, what was his deeper intention and the spirit behind everything, and then try to capture it in some form of art. So both have tremendous value, but if you can bring the two together, they converge, art and chassidus, you really have the best of both worlds. So being that you spoke about Chachma bin Adas, let's go for a little trip beyond Chachma. You know, Chachm is known to be, you mentioned Chachma, the power of what? You know, the flash of an idea, the spark of an idea. But the big question everyone asks is, where do ideas come from? That's all fine once you have a spark and a flash, and then the challenge is how to turn it into Bina, flesh it out, and develop it into a full-blown picture. But how do you get Chachm uh, triggered in the first place? So there are, uh, we shall say, uh, alternative methods some foreign substances some people try to use to open up those channels. Um, I'm not going to get now into commentary whether that works or doesn't work and how permanent or temporary that may be. But maybe, I don't know if you'll be surprised to know, 
But this is really the essence of what uh, Chassidus is. So you may have heard the expression, Chassidus often cites the language from Kabbalah, from the Arizal, and from Zohar, a thing called Chochmes Tema. Chochmes Tema, loosely translated, how I translate it, would be super, super conscious wisdom. Well, literally it means the hidden wisdom. So conscious wisdom is that spark as soon as you become aware of an idea. But what's on the other side of the curtain? What's going on behind the, behind the scenes or under the dashboard or whatever the expression you want to use? Like what's happening on the other side? So psychology likes to use the word collective unconsciousness or collective consciousness, that there's somewhere a type of reservoir of infinite amount of intelligence. And there's only a very, sh a very narrow uh, channel that allows consciousness to be born from there. But Chassidus goes into elaborate discussion of what's going on on that side of the other side of the curtain. And indeed actually teaches us how to broaden the channels. You know, there's an expression they say there's a very thin line between uh, madness and genius. Anybody has to deal with that uh, line here? You don't have to raise your hands. Huh? So, why? Because, um, um, because madness, even though it sounds so... Um, so, uh, so negative, but in fact, it, it really comes down to the fact that conscious intelligence is actually limited experiences. You know, just to use a simple example, God forbid someone goes through any trauma or loss, or for that matter, any joyous experience, but especially a negative one. If we were to live constantly with the initial trauma that we had, we've no way we could ever survive. It's important that we forget, or at least the temperature goes down. Because our minds actually have chemicals that compartmentalize. So very intense events that happen in our lives ultimately get so-called closed up in one closet. You can access it, but what happens is if those, um, what they call a chemical imbalance, or there's something that breaks down the boundaries between the compartments of our mind, then that could either lead to madness because you just can't, you're overwhelmed by so much experience. Imagine ideas didn't stop flowing. They say when the Mittler Rebbe would say chassidus, sometimes he would say sha, sha, sha still. Because the mind, the flow, the Nevi'as HaMeichim was so intense, he had to like quiet it down and silence it. The Ragachava, another great genius, on Shabbos he had tremendous amount of pain because he could not write down his ideas. So it was just flowing and it just overwhelmed him. So think of like a reservoir, literally, like in your kitchen sink, suddenly the faucet breaks. What happens? It starts flooding, not due to the fact of lack of water, too much water. The same, I think, is with ideas. For ideas to really be able to be absorbed properly, it has to be like raindrops. A faucet that reg regulates the flow of the intelligence from the superconscious to the conscious. So if the channels are too narrow, then you have a limited amount of ideas. If they're too wide, you can either have total madness because it's so overwhelming. In other words, madness is actually closer to reality than sanity. Let's put it that way. So if you ever feel insane, it actually coming from a very profound place. We have shtus the kedusha, and the shtus the lumaza. Shtus the kedusha is a certain type of holy insanity where you're going beyond the rational. You're going beyond limitations. When we say simcha perez gather, simcha joy breaks down barriers. You're breaking down the regular structures to go to a deeper place. That's why I'm Purim, Adaloyada, to the point where you're beyond even the consciousness between the distinction between dark and, night and light and so on. Or it creates genius. So that's why there's a very thin line. You cross the line a little too much, the genius can become madness and vice versa. So the, cha the challenge is how do you create a, a flow, but not one that's overwhelming? And that's why in Chassidus there's so much talk about grounding yourself, what they call today integration. It's not just enough to have a deeper uh, super conscious experience, you have to be able to integrate it. What you call rotze and shuv, tension and resolution. So yes, it's very healthy for a person to have that a somewhat of angst that they reach to something beyond, but not too much or else you can expire. You know, I was always very fascinated by the Jimi Hendrixes and the Jim Morrisons and the Janis Joplins of our previous generation. 
I know you didn't come here to hear about them, but they were geniuses in their time. They all called the 24 Club. They all OD'd, unfortunately, at 24 years old. And they were, no question, geniuses, but they had no way grounding. They kept going up, 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 and there was nowhere to go. Had they learned a little chassidus, they would have learned that as deep as you go, you also have to have the channels that bring it back down and ground it. So in other words, it's not just about a, high, a spiritual high. It's not just about a transcendent experience. It's a transcendent experience that's channeled into a real life down below, into family, into love, into relationships. How many we hear about artists, how their selfishness, and in their genius, they were so selfish. How did they reconcile that? Because they didn't have this balance. They had one part, not the second part. So in a way, on a deeper level, you can say celebrating chassidus and art coming together is really the joining of the superconscious, we'll call it states of infinity, and how to channel that into the finite. Because ultimately, an artist, the same thing with a musician, the same thing with a writer or a speaker, if they're really doing their job well, what they're really doing is giving us a taste of a higher reality that's not so visible and putting some image to it. It's like basically painting the invisible. The feelings, the sentiments, the things that you don't see with the naked eye. It's like giving structure to that which is beyond structure. Expressing the inexpressible, if you wish. So I've always found this to be an ultimate uh, gift that any one of us that is able to be, do that and encourage others to do that is really fulfilling as was pointed out by, uh, what do we call you? Yitzhak Muli, one of the greats, okay? Um, that the, 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 the mission of our lives to bridge these two worlds, the world of Chachm Estima and the world of Chachm Agluya, and then from there to extend it through Bina into all of our faculties, after that come the Midas, so it gives birth to love and reverence and compassion, and all the Midas, all the way through Malchus. So here's not the place to go through all of it, but the bottom line is that this is the essence of what Chassidus is. There's just many ways to do this. And the truth is, when we do a mitzvah, we're doing exactly the same thing. You know, Chassidus asks the question, is a mitzvah finite or infinite? Because on one hand, it's very finite. Every mitzvah has its very clear parameters. You know, comes the, day, the night of Pesach, no chametz, only matzah, and exactly how much matzah you're supposed to eat. You know, Shabbos has its laws. Everything is precise to the, to the minute, to the second. All the shiurim, all the measurements. On the other hand, we say a mitzvah is God's will. And God is infinite and beyond infinite. So what Chassidus beautifully captures is that a mitzvah is actually bottling the infinite in the finite structures. It's really infinite. But it's just another way for the infinite to express itself is through a mitzvah. So when you do a good deed... A simple good deed, a little beautiful gesture, a penny to charity. In the finite, what you're doing is channeling the infinite. And that's like the secret of all secrets. The Rebbe once wrote a letter to a conference on mysticism in England. The Rebbe wrote, what's unique about Jewish mysticism in, compar in comparison to other schools of mysticism, especially in the Eastern world? He said the difference is that in Jewish mysticism, you can achieve more through an act than through a meditation. One act. Because you see, a meditation takes us to another higher place, but it doesn't bring it back down to earth. And a mitzvah brings it down to earth. And that is the, hard, the hardest job. Ask anyone who's artistic or creative, who lives in that world of energy, and sometimes that infinite is extremely difficult to ground yourself. It's very extreme, extremely difficult to go after you have this creative uh, surge to suddenly say, okay, I have to diaper my baby's bi diapers, you know, or I have to uh, be, do, do so, a simple act that seems so humble. It's like it's be beneath me because I'm a genius, I'm an artist. And that is ultimately the challenge of bringing and balancing the two. Rabbi Akiva was the only one that was able to go into a place like that. Nichnas b'shalom v'yotsa b'shalom. He went in peace and came in peace. It also means in one piece meaning complete and wholesome, where the other three, each one, one went mad, mad again, one died, and one became an apostate. Because when you enter those deeper realms of the superconscious states, it's not that simple. It can be very dangerous even, as, as deep as it may be. Not of an avil, in the in the Beis Hamikdash, in the Mishkan, they burned out, literally. First burnout in history, it says, a strange flame, strange fire, 
You may be familiar with that expression, it's straight from Chumash, where it says that they went in, but they did not know how to contain it. And they came from a great place. So I want to com commend um, the, the organizers and all of you that participate and all of us that are here, family and so on, that you're part of a historic process, maybe the end of the last steps before Mashiach coming, where we're bridging two worlds. And this is where Chassidus comes, a deeper truth that reveals the lie. It reveals the lie of the superficial universe that the world that we look at with our naked eyes is not the reality. It's not reality. It's the tip of the iceberg. It's a very surface reality. It's a surface reality where we see things with limited with limited tools and parameters. And to you, to quote um, Sir Arthur Eddington, if I may, he was a physicist, and he said, when people asked him in the beginning when quantum mechanics was just coming on becoming popular and becoming known with all its counterintuitive and bizarre conclusions. So he was asked, no one ever saw an atom, let alone a subatomic particle. How do you come to all these strange conclusions? Which were literally contradictory, things like, things that, that, we, that, that uh, there's no definitive, there's no deterministic state, for example, for, for, for light or for other properties and so on. And he gave the analogy of a fisherman that spread his his net across all the seas of the world and he gathered all the different types of fish and he started documenting them. Yeah, different species, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. And after his long research, the fisherman came to a, 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 a genius conclusion. He decided and determined there are no fish in the sea that are shorter than half inch long. Okay, he was about to make this big announcement when his little daughter sees what he's about to say. She says, Daddy, what are you saying? We have a fish tank here with goldfish that are shorter than a half inch long. You don't even have to go to the seas. So, of course, after observing the net that he used, his net had spaces, the ropes were half inch spaces. So imagine all the fish that were shorter than a half inch simply fell back into the water. So he just has to add one thing in his brilliant uh, thesis, and that is that if you use a net with half inch spaces, you're never going to catch fish uh, half inch, the shorter than a half inch long. But I don't think you need a wizard or a scientist to know that. I think we all know that. So in other words, the problem was not with the, 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 with the fish. It was the instruments that we use. And what artists do is they teach us new instruments, how to look at the world with a new set of eyes. And that's what Chassidus does. To look at the world that what you see on the surface level is only the external. Inside is a neshama, a soul. Souls are invisible but invisible to the naked eye. They're not invisible to another neshama. So souls see souls and we experience souls. So it's really about expanding our uh, containers, our instruments, if you wish, our tools. And when you expand them, then you're able to contain and experience things that are far beyond that which is uh, visible to the naked eye and to our senses. So it's really going into the supersensory or the superconscious world and drawing it down into this world. And in, in an essence, that is what Mashiach is when we say there will be no more evil and destruction in the world because what? The world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. What's the connection? Because when you have divine knowledge that's coming from these higher states of consciousness and you bring that into this conscious world, there is no room for destruction or violence or hate or for that matter divisiveness because we're all part of one larger whole. We're all, yes, we're all, we're all pieces of one more beautiful cosmic piece of art that God created. And when we look at each other, we're able to look at each other as being one part of that bigger picture where each of us is indispensable and necessary and each of us needs the other to complement uh, us. And when you look at it that way, that the world is one beautiful mosaic of art, each of us fulfilling our particular role and therefore respecting that. And as I said, complementing each other, it's a whole different way to look at the world. So hopefully, Maybe we can bottle and replicate and scale this uh, formula that we have here through this art and through the bridging of these worlds and bring it to the larger world. They need it now more than ever where there's a moral compass that's lacking and moral clarity as we see in the Middle East and Israel and so on. You just see, you talk about lies revealing a deeper truth. You see the lies out there. So the more we shine light and clarity and truth, the more powerful it dispels the confusion and the darkness and the fragmentation and creates that ultimate Hashem Achad unity, which is the cardinal rule of all beautiful art. 
So again, I commend you all. Be Hatzlacha Rabba in this uh, effort, making it happen. Thank you so much. And uh, no, really, and uh, you should all applaud each other right now. Give it applause. <laughs> everyone, everyone should have a kosher for and Pesach, especially this year. Benisan Nigalu, Benisan Asidin Goyal, time of our redemption is this month, a time of miracles, Nisim, Nisim from the word Nes, t- double Nisim. And as I said before, we should watch even before Pesach, and before Yer Aleph Nisim to the Geula, the end of the nightmares that we're seeing. Hashem should continue showering His brachas and His miracles as we've just seen just, this, uh, just yesterday. And we uh, shouldn't even need these miracles and just have Shalom V'Nesati Shalom Baris now and forever. Thank you so much.